Thanks everybody for joining this webinar uh, from SRI, the Society for Research on Educational Effectiveness. Uh, we have four presenters today. I'm just going to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Sharon will be the first presenter. I think after that we have Alejandro, after that myself, and after that Alex. Um, and we have four presentations on teacher professional development in developing countries. Uh, my name is Thomas de Haup. I'm a principal economist at American Institutes for Research in international research and evaluation. Uh, my work primarily focuses on women's collectives in India, Nigeria, and Uganda, and various education studies, in, for example, in Zambia, and an evidence synthesis on education in emergencies. So I think we can just move on to the other presenters to also introduce themselves. Thank you so much. <laughs> I can start. I'm uh, Sharon Wolf. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the Graduate School of Education. Um, my work focuses on teacher professional development, um, supporting parents and teachers to engage in their children's uh, learning and development. My background is in developmental psychology. Hi, everyone. I'm Alejandro Arimian. I'm an assistant professor of applied psychology and economics at NYU Steinart, that is the education school. Um, my work focuses on uh, low and middle income countries and how specifically how to improve um, classroom management and school um, management to address the needs of diverse and uh, changing populations. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Ebley. I am an assistant professor of economics and education at Teachers College, which is Columbia's Graduate School of Education. Um, I'm a development economist by training, and most of my work has to do with the evaluation of education policy in developing countries and how that relates to studies of personal identity and the sort of compounding effects of the formation of human capital and influences that affect our belief about that process. Thanks all. Uh, the way we're going to do it today is we're going to each present, start, starting with Sharon. After that, we have prepared some comments on each other's papers, uh, which we will give immediately after the presentations. Um, in addition to that, we would certainly also like to keep some room at the end and for everybody else to um, have opportunities to ask questions to the presenters. Um, from what I understand, there are also opportunities to ask questions in the chat box. Um, so please feel free to do so. Um, for now, I'm just giving the floor to Sharon um, to start with her presentation. Thanks for the opportunity to present. I'm, work, I'm sharing a paper that's a working paper with my colleague Guillerme Lachand uh, called Arm Wrestling in the Classroom. Um, and I want to just start by um, sharing a cartoon um, that might help us think about teacher accountability and how the ways we think about teacher accountability might change across context and time. Um, and also the importance of parent and teacher interactions, how those might affect teaching practices. So right on the left here, we see uh, parents with the teacher asking their child to explain the bad grades. This is what we think of as teacher accountability maybe in the 60s and then more recent days, we see parents with their child asking the teacher to explain these bad grades. Um, so in our um, context, uh, we're, we're working in Cote d'Ivoire, and so um, I want to give you a little bit of background on teacher accountability in Sub-Saharan Africa. So absenteeism from the classroom is a very common problem in many countries. Um, in a study that, uh, a representative study from seven countries that actually represents 40% of the total population in Sub-Saharan Africa, teachers were absent from the classroom 44% of the time. Either they were not in school or they were in school but not in the classroom when they should be teaching. And some have called the situation a motivation crisis. Um, there's obviously lots of systemic reasons why these, uh, these issues occur. Um, but one way you might think that uh, we could try to get teachers, uh, hold teachers more accountable would be to increase monitoring, whether it's through parent monitoring teachers, schools monitoring teachers more closely. On one hand, these could increase teacher effort and lead to better educational outcomes. But on the other hand, they might actually unintentionally crowd out uh, motivation and effort, especially for those teachers who already are putting in a lot of effort. And actually the literature on monitoring teachers is quite mixed in terms of the effects on teachers and learning outcomes. 
Um, so Cote d'Ivoire is a, a country in West Africa um, that ranks uh, fairly low uh, in, around the region and around the world uh, in terms of human development um, and also in terms of educational outcomes. The youth literacy rate is about 50%, adult literacy rate is lower. Um, and in the region with the PASIC exams, which are uh, national exams to compare Francophone countries um, in West Africa, uh, Cote d'Ivoire tends to be below average or at the bottom. So uh, more than 60% of sixth graders are not competent in mathematics, for example. The primary education is organized in cycles. So children um, will be in grade one and they will always be passed to grade two, no matter what. They're within one cycle, but at the end of that cycle, they then get tested and that determines whether they will have to repeat grade two or they can move on to grade three. Um, and so these, these cycles of these two years, um, because we're really interested in our study on outcomes of grade repetition and dropout, we're focusing on this final year within each cycle. So our sample is gonna be comprised of second, fourth, and sixth graders. Um, in our project, we partnered with the Ivorian Ministry of Education and with MOVA, which is a social enterprise that implements um, SMS-based messages and nudges, nudge bots, they call them, to engender behavior change. They have many programs and work across different sectors, but we worked with them on their program called Edu Plus, which means more education in French. Um, and this really aims to increase educational engagement and improve children's learning outcomes in different ways. So um, there's, we worked with them actually to develop a program for teachers because they primarily have worked with parents in the past. Um, and participants will get nudges, these SMS messages twice a week with information and suggested activities for behavior changed. Um, for teachers, the goal is to increase attendance, time on task while teaching, and also to support children's learning and social and emotional development. And for parents, the aim is at boosting motivation and beliefs about the return to investment in education and also increasing engagement uh, in the child's school. So the sequences are based in principles of behavioral economics around how to really engender change in behavior. So this is just an example sequence of one message that was one uh, key message that was sent to teachers. Each message is sent over two weeks because the sequence starts with a motivating fact followed by uh, an activity that is connected to that motivating fact that teachers can try in the classroom followed the following week by a message asking how that activity went and teachers can reply and get some support. And then um, finally, a growth message to try to get them to really continue some of these activities and behaviors moving forward. So this is just about small group activity and fostering children's peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. Here's another example of uh, a message that was sent to parents or caregivers. And this one was focused on engagement in school. So trying to really ultimately get parents to take interest in their child's um, school, uh, school lives and then getting them to engage in the school, go visit the school. So our research design was we were in 100 public schools in the Abuaso and Boafle regions. And as I said, we had three classrooms within each school. So we had about 300 classrooms. Um, and it was a cross randomized trial. So schools uh, and classrooms were either assigned to send messages to actually all the parents in the school receive them. Our sample in terms of data collection is just those three grades. Uh, parent messages, teacher messages, or the two together uh, compared to a control group of schools. So today I'm going to share uh, three sets of uh, data with you that we use to evaluate the impacts of the program. We have classroom administrative data on student dropout rates. Um, we also did surveys with children, parents, and teachers, both at baseline and follow-up. So we had the same measures twice before and after the intervention. And then we had some puzzling results, which I'll share with you. And so we actually went back and did some follow-up data collection right at the start of the next school year with all the teachers and with a random subsample of parents to try to understand really their beliefs about each other and each other's inputs um, and how they might react to different inputs by the other party. So we do intend to treat um, analyses, we're using OLS models where we have dummies for the three treatment arms, all relative to the control. And in those um, survey uh, measures where we have two measures before and after the intervention, we use individual, add, add an individual fixed effects. We're clustering all of our standard errors at the classroom level. And we also have combined different variables um, so that we reduce the number of items and outcomes that we're looking at. This is all in our uh, pre-analysis plan. Okay, so let me share some results with you. I'm going to first show you the main impacts on student dropout rates. What do we find of, what are the effects of nudging teachers, nudging parents, or nudging both on dropout rates of students? 
Um, we then, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, we, there might be some variation based on teachers' baseline effort to be monitored, right? Some teachers might respond in different ways based on how hard they feel they're working before, um, before any monitoring begins. And so I'll show you heterogeneous impacts um, based on baseline teacher performance, both on dropout rates and teacher attendance, and then um, parent, child, and teacher input. So we can start to think about some of the mechanisms through which we find what we do. And then after that, I'll show you some of the follow-up analyses that we did. Okay, so here's just our main treatment impacts um, on school dropout rates. <clears throat> if you see the base, the control group mean is about 4.7%. So we found reductions of nudging parents, very large reductions of 2.5 um, percentage points. So basically ha almost in half, we cut the um, dropout rates when you just nudge parents. When we just nudge teachers, we found something very similar. This is for the full sample, but when we nudged both together, uh, all those effects were counteracted. Okay, so there's no impacts on student dropout rates if both parents and teachers receive the intervention. Uh, we broke it down by grade level just to show you that these impacts are actually larger when uh, for the older students, really driven by the older students. Um, but we, our main analysis is for the full sample. So already we, <laughs> this was very puzzling to us. Um, and so we, we tried to probe a little bit and try to look at a heterogeneous treatment effects based on baseline teacher performance. So we had students report on how often their teacher was absent uh, or was in the classroom in the past two weeks. And using this measure, we split teachers into what we're calling high effort teachers, which is the above median baseline attendance, and low effort teachers, which is below median baseline attendance. And what we see as impacts on dropouts actually they don't really vary very much for those low effort teachers. We see reductions for all, um, all treatment arms. But for the high effort teachers, we are actually seeing pretty significant differences based on who is nudged. So for high effort teachers, if parents alone are nudged, we see these reductions in student dropout rate. If teachers alone are nudged, we're seeing smaller reductions, but still reductions. When both are nudged, we actually see these are not statistically significant, but completely opposite direction, right? Even potentially an increase in dropout rates. So something about nudging both parents and teachers seem to backfire, especially for those high effort teachers. I'm sorry, and we see, uh, I, for the sake of time, I won't go into the teacher attendance, but we again see that um, we'll see um, effects on attendance for those low effort teachers, not the high effort teachers. Um, we then looked at a set of, um, of inputs, teacher, parent, and child inputs, and to look at impacts across these different treatment arms to see is there, can we kind of find some explanations around what was happening here for these different groups and these different groups of teachers. So I'm just gonna, again, for the sake of time, share um, a few uh, results for you. Um, so what it looks like, parent beliefs, this is how much parents believe their child are doing well in school, um, increase if they are nudged alone, they, they start to think that their child might be doing better in school, but when they're nudged alongside teachers, those effects are reversed. So there's something about encouraging this interaction between the two that seems to backfire um, and lead parents to actually be more pessimistic about their child's uh, education. We see a similar pattern around corporal punishment. All the treatment arms reduce, at least in the trend level direction, corporal punishment, but the effects are much smaller when both groups are nudged. But interestingly, student self-report effort increases in all conditions, which is interesting. So lower dropout rates might be mediated by student effort, um, but also driven by a combination of parents being more optimistic about their child's school performance and children being exposed to less corporal punishment. Um, and those, don't, uh, those two important mediators don't seem to change when both parents and teachers are nudged together. So we did a follow-up analysis um, to look at parents and teachers' best response functions uh, to each other's, um, to each other's uh, reported effort. And again, for the sake of time, let's just look at the teachers here. So what we did was ask teachers how much would they increase their effort in, in their work if uh, parents were showing up at the school unannounced, anywhere from never to every day, right? So we had five different um, times, once a year, once a month, once a week. And when we asked parents if one out of parent, uh, one out of 10 parents was coming at these different frequencies, we see that teachers are increasing their effort the more parents are coming. But when we ask them, what about 10 out of 10 parents showing up unannounced? Teachers are increasing their effort if that's happening somewhat infrequently, but the more frequently more parents are coming, we actually see an inverted U-shaped curve. So 
too much monitoring by too many parents actually backfires and teachers actually start to report that they would put forth less effort in their, um, in their, in their teaching. This actually bears out in our data, which is very interesting. So here on the y-axis, we asked, we asked again children, um, did your parent come to the school any time in the past uh, week, at least once? So then we computed for each school the percent of uh, parents who were showing up in the past week. And on the y-axis, we have dropout rates. And what you see is in those schools where no parents or few parents are showing up, there's really no impacts on dropout. In those schools where you know 40 to 80 percent of the parents are showing up at least once a week, we're actually seeing reductions in dropout. In the schools where all the parents are coming, or many more, um, more frequently, we see this reversal, um, no effects or even some positive effects. Now, this is we have um, this is classroom level data, so we have a smaller sample size, um, but the trend is really in line with what we had uh, we saw in teachers' responses in the previous slide. So just to quickly conclude, I think I'm out of time, um, monitoring teachers' efforts, either directly or through parent engagement, we found decreased dropout rates, but combining the two failed and actually backfired. And this is actually in line with qualitative evidence that we've seen um, in sub both in um, Tanzania and in Ghana around frustrated interactions between teachers and parents, really teachers reporting frustration with parents the way parents are engaging with their children's education, and also lab-based experimental findings where too high levels of monitoring actually decreases worker productivity. Um, so we might want to think about if monitoring interventions, we think that they're going to be effective. Um, we want to be careful not to demotivate teachers, especially those high effort teachers. So adaptations could include targeting maybe a smaller share of parents in the community or moderating the extent to which parents are encouraged to approach teachers. Um, but also we might need to uh, elicit teachers' beliefs about their own effort first in order to target these programs more effectively. So um, here's a, we have a working paper out which you're, um, you can just click on this QR code if you're interested and I'll stop there. Thanks. So I think I'm turning it over to Alex, right? Right. So, so I should comment now and great. All right, sorry about that. I'm waiting for not that. Um, all right, so my comments broadly are that this is a really exciting piece of work. I think um, it's going to make a really nice contribution to understanding of the way that monitoring interacts with intrinsic motivation. And so I think my comments are gonna focus primarily on sort of work going forward from this. Um, I think the idea of having teachers and parents both nudged and having their coincidence lead to this negative effect, I think tells us something really exciting about intrinsic motivation and how that works. And so I think in future work, one thing that would be really exciting to measure is how teachers effort responds. So do they spend more time on task in the classroom? Do they have more positive affect or negative affect depending on the level of monitoring? And I think, you know, the paper as it stands is a really nice contribution. I wouldn't change that much about it, honestly, um, other than, you know, for the, for the next round of work, you know, sort of digging into the observational um, teacher effort measures that might give you sort of a full picture of how teachers are responding to this. Um, I think in terms of interpreting this in the context of the literature on monitoring, there's this big question about what is the focus of the monitoring, right? It could be on getting teachers in the classroom, getting, be getting them to focus on given pieces of effort, you know, we, maybe we care about lessons completed or we care about number of students above a threshold, or it could be on coaching, sort of improving their ability to deliver whatever the school wants them to deliver. And so I think the next round might be interesting to sort of do something similar, except tease apart those three ways that we might go about monitoring. Um, I think there's really exciting work from Peter Bergman, I think it's coming out in the journal Political Economy about nudging parents and I think your work is really in great dialogue with that and I think you shed some very cool light on what he's done and how that might interact with teachers um, and I think the last thing I'll say is it'll be really exciting to see what this looks like in the sort of medium term you know a year later do these things wear off like we might expect or are there sort of longer term differences as a result of um, this kind of intervention in teachers and parents lives but congratulations it's really exciting work. Thanks. Thanks, um, both. And I think we're moving to Alejandro right now for the next presentation. Um, as I mentioned before, like any other questions, please save them until the end. We will definitely give you an opportunity to ask those later. 
Great. Um, hi, everyone. Can everyone see me, hear me, and see the presentation? Yes? Okay, good. Um, so glad to be here in um, this great company today. Um, and glad to see a lot of the names that I recognize in the participants list. I'm going to be presenting today joint work with Karthik Morelli Daran at UC San Diego and with Chris Wal Walters in UC Berkeley, um, which is this uh, large scale experiment to hire an additional worker to teach preschool education in um, uh, child care centers in India. Okay. Um, so just the general motivation is not going to be unfamiliar to many of you. Developing countries have made great progress in improving school enrollment and completions the last two decades, but however you measure it, learning levels are still quite low. So I'm giving you both first the figures of the National Achievement Survey, which is the official assessment, um, and then off the Annual Status of Education Report, which is an NGO um, assessment uh, representative of rural India as a whole. And you can see that However you measure it, learning levels are, are quite low, even in very basic skills, right? So one promising option that you might uh, want to focus on to alleviate um, those low level learning levels is to improve the quality of early childhood education. Um, so far, expansion of education in developing countries has focused mostly on school education. But if part of the problem is that children who are starting school education are not ready for it, then you might want to invest a little bit more on uh, developing quality um, ECE. Um, so even though there's quite a lot of interest um, for ECE, I would say that it's um, fair to say that there is relatively little evidence of how to improve the quality of early childhood education, not so much construction of preschool centers or um, construction of centers that include um, um, additional components, but rather how do you actually improve the quality of a system as a whole. So that's what we're going to focus on um, in this study. Um, so today I'm going to present experimental evidence on the largest ECE program in the world, which is the Integrated Child Development, uh, Development Scheme, or ICDS for short. So it serves about 36 million three to six year olds for free. Uh, and because it's free, it, it obviously caters more to the poor. Uh, it provides a range of early childhood um, services, not just education. This is very important for the interpretation of our results. So this includes both health and nutrition services in addition to preschool education. Um, and it does so through a massive operation of 1.35 Agamwadi or courtyard shelter um, centers, um, or I'm gonna refer to them as AWCs, which are staffed typically with two workers. One of them is an Agamwadi worker, or I'm going to refer to her as an AWW, who is responsible for health and education services, and an Agamwadi helper or an AWH. I'm not going to mention her uh, a lot um, because she's mostly responsible for preparing meals, feeding the children, and cleaning the AWCs. Um, so just so you get a visual picture of what an Agamwadi center looks like, um, here's the center in Chennai. You can see that it is um, quite well equipped. Chennai is the capital of the Tamil Nadu, which is the site of our um, uh, of our study. Um, and you can see the, the Agamwadi uh, worker um, is um, uh, helping uh, the children um, eat um, at no time. Okay, so in spite of its massive importance and scaled, um, ICDS has quite uh, limited staffing and funding. In fact, um, as um, it will become increasingly clear um, through the presentation, a Naganwadi worker has multiple responsibilities. So not just uh, uh, delivering early childhood education, but also helping with um, uh, 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 vaccination for um, uh, uh, children and uh, um, women in the village, helping with um, um, uh, home visitation, um, helping with providing advice on, on health services to mothers. Um, so, and even helping with um, tasks that are unrelated to um, early childhood um, development, but that are relevant for the community, such as sometimes I, AWWs get pulled uh, to help, say, for example, for an, with an election, right? So, um, so that's an important um, um, uh, contextual piece of information to keep in mind, because that means that AWWs are going to be trying to do a lot of things at the same time. Um, and another point of um, information that is quite relevant for this context is that their salaries are much lower than those of civil service uh, teachers that you might be familiar with um, through, uh, through work in India. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the effect of hiring a worker exclusively devoted to teaching preschool education in the state of Tamil Nadu, uh, the government of Tamil Nadu. What it did is it offered um, treatment centers a one-time grant to um, to hire what they called an early childhood care and education or ECCE facilitator. I'm just going to refer to her as a facilitator to assist the AWW with just preschool education. Okay, so 
a few important differences between AWWs and facilitators. They're higher on two year contracts, and but their eligibility resembles that of AWWs. So they have to be female, they have to at least be 18 years of age, they have to be local from the community, and they have to have pay, passed the grade 10 board exam, which is essentially a, a high school education um, level. Um, also important for our context is that the government of Tamil Nadu had already uh, worked with UNICEF to develop a pretty robust ECC curriculum that uh, divides every month um, on different themes and every week it has different activities and it even has a calendar from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. for what children should be doing um, at each point in time. It also has manuals and it has trained um, facilitators in the expected division of laborers with the AWW. So um, emphasizing the fact that the facilitator was exclusively expected to devote her time to um, preschool education. Okay, and just for accountability purposes, the government had also asked facilitators to log their daily activities on, on an activities register. Okay, um, so what we did is um, we conducted, um, uh, uh, we drew a sample that was proportional to size so that the results from our trial would be representative to Tamil Nadu as a whole. So for those of you unfamiliar with India or Tamil Nadu, this is all of India. Tamil Nadu is a southern state, it's a very well developed state. And the districts in orange are the districts that are part of our trial. Um, oops. There we go. Um, so we randomly assigned um, half of the centers to receive a facilitator and half of the centers to not receive them. And we stratified this randomization by district, whether there was a vacancy um, for the AWW position and uh, just a host of local demographics. Um, this wouldn't be surprising to anyone. I'm not going to go into some of these buttons, but um, both the centers um, and the workers as well, the children were comparable at the start of the experiment, which is important uh, to ensure the validity of the results. Okay. Um, so the idea is that we can then reweight all of our um, impact estimates to get estimates that are applicable to um, Tamil Nadu as a whole. Okay, so we collected four main types of data. We did um, assessments of math, language, and executive functioning skills at two points in time, baseline and endline, about 18 months apart. Um, we administer those individually with a child orally and in the local language. Um, and at Endline, we actually administer these assessments in two sites, both in the centers where uh, we uh, were likely to capture the children who had come uh, regularly to the centers and um, in the households, um, just to make sure that um, if a child came at the beginning of the trial, but then later left um, the center, um, we still would capture um, him or her. Um, so you can think of the results that I'm going to present to you today um, for the household assessments and for the center assessments as speaking to different types of estimates. So the center assessments will give you an impact estimate for the children who came regularly to the centers versus the household assessments will give you a sense of what's the intended treat effect on all the children that these um, ICDS um, centers are trying to serve. We also collected information on weight and height at both points in time. We also tracked implementation fidelity, which I'll tell you about shortly. And we had two sets of visits. We had unannounced visits to check attendance um, and punctuality of the workers and the facilitators. And we also had an, um, announced observations to track how the actual um, uh, time that was allotted to preschool education was actually being spent. And I'll show you some results on that in a second. Okay, how did we estimate the effect this is a very straightforward estimation in which we accounted for randomization straight up fixed effects uh, for a couple of covariants that were imbalanced at, uh, at baseline for the AWW um, and um, of course for the treatment dummy um, and we estimated impacts as I told you before, both on the samples for the children assessed in the centers and in their homes. Uh, we had um, very, uh, we had no differential attrition, but we had uh, very different um, follow up rates for the um, household assessments and for the center assessments as I show you here in this last bullet. Um, so, so as I said, keep that in mind when interpreting the results from the different assessments. Okay, so let's get right into the substance of it. Um, so in terms of implementation fidelity, the intervention was very well implemented. Virtually all the treatment AWCs hired a facilitator so by, by the first round of process monitoring, which was about five months after um, the notification for the hiring was issued, 98% of the centers had a facilitator. In fact, the average facilitator was hired within 15 to 30 days of the notification. Nearly all of the facilitators required um, received the, the required training, which was about six 
um, face of length. Um, the vast majority of them had an activities register as they were expected to have it, and, and, and a similar number actually had it up to date. Um, they were interestingly expected to work half the hours of the, of the worker because the, the center is open for um, twice the time. Um, so they were correspondingly paid around half of the salary, so about 4,000 rupees or about 60 bucks per month compared to the 8,000 rupees of AWWs well, we're paid per month. All right. So in terms of results, the first um, results that I want to show you are on worker attendance and punctuality. And I want to walk you through this table very quickly so that you understand what you're seeing. So columns one and two are showing you the results for the um, AWWs, both in the control centers and in the treatment centers, OK? Then um, what column three is going to do is, is going to compare those two groups of workers um, just to understand how the behavior of workers changed across uh, the control and the treatment groups. Then I'm going to show you um, uh, statistics for the facilitators um, themselves. And then I'm going to show you how did the facilitators differ from um, the workers in the treatment centers. Okay, so those are columns one through five. You can see that the direction of all of these effects in terms of attendance and punctuality is what you would expect. Um, so you have positive but in statistically insignificant effects on the share of workers that arrived um, at the center by opening time. You have a negative and statistically significant significant um, uh, share of um, uh, workers who arrived by the preschool education start time. And then you have a positive, but um, so just again, significant effect on, on the absence rate. Um, more interestingly, perhaps um, for, for, um, for a study is a comparison between the ECC facilitators and the workers. So if you compare, say, for example, the ECC facilitators and the workers um, in treatment centers on arrival by PSC start time, you can see that uh, facilitators are more, more likely to arrive on time and then of course correspondingly less likely to be absent. Um, okay, but how do the workers actually or the facilitators allocate their time to the different tasks, right? I made a big deal at the beginning of my presentation telling you that um, AWWs had all these different responsibilities um, and that ECC facilitators were, were supposed to devote themselves exclusively to preschool education. Did that happen? Yes. And did it, it did happen. So what I'm showing you here is the minutes per day spent on different um, four main activities, preschool education, administrative tasks, health and nutrition tasks, or being off duty. And I'm happy to go into each one of these categories during the Q&A session if you're interested. Um, you can see exactly as expected through column three that the, the AWWs are spending less time on preschool education, exactly as you would expect them to, and more time on both administrative tasks and health and nutrition tasks, also as you would expect them, suggesting that the facilitator actually allowed the worker to devote more time to these other types of tasks. Interestingly, and consistent with other um, studies in which, um, say, for example, you hire contract teachers in primary schools in India or in, in Kenya, you do see an increase in slack time, and we can discuss that in the Q&A session as well. Um, in fact, if you compare, say, for example, the um, time devoted to preschool education and control, um, um, AWWs, which is in column one, with the impact on um, um, uh, the centers as a whole, you can see that uh, effectively what the treatment did is double the time that was devoted to preschool education which is quite um, an, uh, a sizable improvement. Well, according to that, we also do see um, large impacts on um, achievement um, for all these children. And we find that for math, language, and executive function, so all three subjects that we assessed in the um, center assessments, so for the children who came regularly to, to, to the centers, and we find them only for the first two subjects for um, the household assessments. We also see that they're smaller, correspondingly smaller, nearly a third uh, because of the discussion that we've had before, which is the household assessments capture children who might not have come out regularly to the centers. Um, in fact, you see that if you compare control and treatment children at every point of the achievement distribution, the treatment children seem to be doing better um, across the board, um, across that distribution in both assessments, the AWC and the HH assessments. Although, of course, as you saw from the previous table, the difference is smaller for the HH assessments. Okay. Well, interestingly for us, we also found impacts um, on weight and height for age for these children. Um, so not 
not only did the treatment improve um, the weight for H um, score, as you can see from panel A, from the AWC measurements, uh, but specifically what it did is it reduced the share of um, children who were severely underweight. In fact, if you can see the control mean from column three, panel A, which is 0.09, that is 9% of children were severely underweight, you can see that the reduction is that of nearly a third for severely underweight children. And similar results um, can be also served for the height for each of these children. Children. That means that the fact that the AWEWs were able to devote more time to health and nutrition actually mattered for the lives of these children, or that's how we would interpret this narrative. You can see that in the household measurements, we find similar directions, but not quite the same magnitude or statistical significance of the effects for the reasons that we've already discussed, and we can get into that as well. Um, finally, and to wrap up, we did um, uh, a calculation of the cost effectiveness of this intervention. Um, we did this in three parts. We first um, tried to project future earnings using mostly household survey data um, from Tamil Nadu and a few assumptions that you can see spelled out there. We then drew on our experimental impacts. Importantly, for our discussion um, in the following slides, we used the more conservative impacts, so the impacts from the household um, assessments, not the impacts from the um, from the AWC assessments. And then we, we try to calculate the benefit cost ratio, uh, which was, um, according to our calculations, about 12 times. So the public, ret the, the return of the public funds um, invested in this program would be about 12 times its cost. Uh, we tested the sensitivity of our um, um, cost effectiveness, uh, cost benefit ratio to a range of different parameters that you can see in the notes there. Um, and you can see in the gray lines, the five and 95 um, confidence intervals um, for the range of possible um, cost benefit um, ratios. All right, so let me wrap up. Um, so the most important contribution that we make is to show that it is possible to improve early childhood learning with, at a high, um, highly cost-effective way using a government-implemented intervention, which is important to us. Um, once again, ICDS is the world's largest ECE program. Just for comparison, um, I know many of you might be familiar with um, Head Start. According to their own data, there's uh, Head Start serves about 650K uh, funded places in 2019, which compares to 30 36 million children ages three to six in India. So um, relative to it's important for development as a whole, it is quite important. We also contribute to the literature on interventions to improve ECE. Um, and we also show that it's important, it, it's possible to augment state capacity um, through adding locally hired staff. Um, and finally, we speak, of course, to literature on the cost and benefits of, of occupational licensing. I'm going to skim through this just because uh, I think I'm running out of time. All right. So thank you so much. Um, the paper will be available soon, um, and I'll, I'll let you all know, and hopefully we can coordinate with um, with um, Shri to post it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, um, I'm keeping my comments short also to keep enough time for the next presentations, but like in general, like very impressive paper, like answering an ambitious question with a cost effectiveness analysis, like maybe like, two thoughts that I'm having that I'm curious about is like you're looking at the impacts of like on nutrition and on early childhood development outcomes, particularly considering like the low women's force, uh, the, the low labor force participation of women in India, which is like striking in the region and in the world. Like I'm wondering like how that like how this may also affect labor force participation in the long run and what kind of people are currently enrolling in these jobs and could they serve as role models possibly in the future as well for women who would like to um, enroll in the labor force at a later stage. And in addition to that, like I think ICDS is really not the only Indian program where workers are overloaded with tasks. And I'm just wondering like maybe just something to keep him to consider like how what can we say in general based on this paper about like government programs in India? Like how can we ensure that uh, like, do we just need extra staff and like, is that a cost effective solution? Um, Thank you. I'm going to share my screen as well. I think you can see my screen right now. And 
So I'm just going to start uh, by saying like this is joint work on the impact of the eSchool 360 model in Zambia. It's an impact evaluation of cluster randomized control trial. It's joint work with colleagues from American Institutes for Research, Hannah Ring, Garima Siwaf, Paula Diaz, Victoria Rothbart and Anna Istungui, as well as of Palm Associates in Zambia, Gelson Tambo. And basically like the, the, answer, the research question we're really trying to address here is to examine what is the impact, like can technology and education program, technology aided instruction programs in Zambia, can those positively affect learning outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa and particularly in rural areas of Sub-Saharan Africa? I think like, after like an initial rough start of technology and education program in developing countries, I think a lot of the mo more recent evidence shows a lot more promise um, of these programs. But I think in general, also a lot of the evidence is um, in from urban settings and not so much yet in Sub-Saharan Africa. What we're also looking at here is really like uh, a more like, um, like integrated program that also includes various other components like i've so far mentioned the e-learning component of the eSchool 360 program but really it's a it's a multifaceted program with wraparound services that also includes teacher coaching that has a lot of emphasis initially on the infrastructure of the schools solar panels are being installed at the beginning to make sure that teachers actually are able to receive tablets at the beginning um, in which preloaded lessons in which they receive preloaded lessons that are in line with the curriculum of the government of Zambia. One ad other additional component is that there are a lot of community engagement. Uh, teachers are recruited from the community. And all of this is in a context of uh, Zambia, where like uh, the education context, similar to India in the previous presentation, is, is really quite challenging. And it's, it's challenging because like literacy rates are relatively low. Um, and in addition to that, um, also the, uh, not only are the literacy rates relatively low, also there's relatively limited funding for education in Zambia and community schools where we're really talking about here um, are often staffed by untrained underpaid teachers. These community schools have grown a lot in the last couple of years. Really what we're talking about is not like um, a government funded, or it is a government funded schools, but they were initially set up by the community. Um, there were about 100 of those in 1996. There are now about 2,325 in Zambia. And currently there are about 473,000 children that are enrolled in these community schools. So um, these are pretty isolated areas in Zambia, in rural Zambia, where these community schools are being staffed by currently untrained, underpaid teachers. So there's a real like important step to be undertaken to make sure that students in these community schools can improve their learning outcomes, that quality education can also be delivered in these areas as well. So for this, we're working with Impact Network, which is an international NGO. They have set up the eSchool 360 model in Zambia. Um, they are already running these pro this program for uh, a while. A previous non-experimental evaluation also shows promising results, showing uh, a comparison with government schools, shows that they can uh, deliver uh, improved learning outcomes for a lower cost than many of the government schools in Zambia can. And really what these um, interventions also do, it has, a, like, as I already mentioned, it has a very integrated program with an e-learning component, with activity-based learning associated with it, uh, with uh, weekly uh, meetings with teachers as well as teacher coaching. And it all starts with like solar panels that are being installed in schools and like improvement of community schools that are there, set up by the community, but that don't necessarily have the capacity to really uh, deliver high quality education from the start. So how can this program potentially improve learning outcomes? Like with this many components, obviously like there are many different mechanisms through which the program can potentially improve learning outcomes. Um, one of them is in the first place to teach school enrollment and true school attendance. And this is one reason why we're really focusing on intention to trade effects here. 
um, what we're doing in our design is we're comparing treatment schools with con or treatment areas with control areas uh, with all children who are, are eligible to enroll in first grades in our sample. Uh, we're starting from an initial context with low literacy rates, low levels of reading and mathematics achievement, relatively limited funding for community schools. And through this, like through the improved school infrastructure, as well as free education, like demand for education can increase. And that can hopefully then also through the delivery of the uh, curriculum and activity-based learning on the tablets by teachers can, deliver, can lead to high quality education. Um, which hopefully then also improves um, both child enrollment in school at a younger age, possibly child attendance, um, which can then eventually result also in improvements in learning outcomes. So I already mentioned that we're using an intention to treat effects. What we're doing here is uh, we initially started with uh, 149 schools. Um, in the regions where we're working with this program, we're doing this in three districts in Zambia, Petauka, Sinda, and Kateta districts in Zambia. Uh, these are all largely informal schools, the community schools that I was previously speaking about. And of the schools um, that we initially assessed, ultimately 63 schools met the inclusion criteria. We knew that we were going to work for this impact evaluation in 30 treatment schools. Um, and we, from the 63 schools, we randomly assigned 30 schools to the treatment group, 33 schools to the control group. Uh, within five kilometers of the schools, we did a census um, to identify each of the households that had at least one child that was either seven, eight, or six, seven, eight, or nine year olds. Initially, we were not planning to enroll, uh, to also sample six year olds because their likelihood of enrolling in school is a little bit smaller than for seven years olds and eight year olds, but uh, we were not able to achieve our desired sample size by solely uh, focusing on seven year olds, eight year olds, and nine year olds. So we decided to also include six year olds eventually. Ultimately, we're um, coming up with like a treatment group of about 888 students, 977 students in the control group. Uh, we conduct data collection at the household level. Um, important to keep in mind that all of these children um, at baseline were eligible to enroll in first grade. That doesn't necessarily mean that they actually enroll in first grade. Ultimately, in the treatment group, about 61% of the students enrolled in school and 52% of the students in the control group enrolled in schools. So how do we do this? We uh, conduct child assessments at baseline and, and midline. Uh, early grade reading assessments, early grade mathematics assessments, all developed by uh, RTI and that are often implemented by, uh, by in large scale USAID programs. But in addition to that, we also uh, test using the Zambian achievement tests, which focuses more on pre-literacy outcomes and on oral vocabulary assessments. Um, we also conduct qual uh, qualitative data collection. It's a mixed methods design where we're conducting key informant interviews, focus group discussion and classroom observations to also, also assess the fidelity of implementation. I will give you a rough idea of like the context we're speaking about. I already mentioned that these are like relatively isolated areas in Zambia, very rural, um, like, and the community schools are being set up. We're talking about a context with relatively high household food insecurity and like female caregivers years of education is very low with like um, a large percentage of women actually not having had any education one one thing to important to keep in mind is i already mentioned 62 percent of the students enrolled in treatment schools like the likelihood of enrolling increases with the female caregivers years of education um, one reason why we're really not only relying on the early grade math assessment and the early grade reading assessment is because there's potential for floor effects here. Like there have been various like USAID programs where like large percentage of students actually uh, scored zero on these assessments, even after several years. Um, and we wanted to prevent this. Um, and for this reason, we also included the Zambian achievement test and the oral vocabulary test. And the baseline data already shows some indication that like these floor effects are a concern. We will later find out that this is not so much a concern as we initially anticipated. Um, we, but like overall, like there is like, especially at baseline, like the early grade math assessments and the early grade reading assessment scores are very low. Children score below 10% in many instances. 
So what do we find um, in terms of treatment effects? Uh, the table really shows the effects in standard deviations, um, while the graphs uh, display effects in percentage points. And what we find is on the Zambian achievement test, we find positive effects of about 0.16 standard deviations. And perhaps surprisingly, actually, like the effects on the early grade reading assessments, given what I've taken, given what I've said before, we actually find the largest effects there with 0.40 standard deviations. When I say largest, um, it, it really depends on the interpretation because ultimately also like the, the effect sizes in percentage points are relatively small. Um, the early grade reading assessments uh, effect sizes are positive and statistically significant, but overall um, the effect sizes in standard deviations are quite different um, from the effect sizes in standard uh, in percentage points with AGRA and AGMA percentage points uh, effect sizes being very similar to each other and standard deviation effect sizes being quite different from each other. If you look, just look at the standard deviations, the AGRA uh, effect sizes are a lot larger than the AGMA effect size as well. If you look at the percentage points effect sizes, like the effect sizes are approximately the same. Um, one, one, small uh, one small caution here is that we found a slight imbalance at baseline for ECMA overall, like for all of the variables that we're looking at, we find in general like balance between treatment and control hub, uh, schools, and we control for any imbalances at baseline in our uh, regression results where we uh, use an ANCOVA approach controlling for the baseline values of the outcome of the interest. So we also estimated two types of treatment effects on the treatment. Uh, for that, we used um, an instrumental variable approach where the first stage is really about either whether students were ever enrolled in school in the year be, uh, and before the endline survey, we're estimating impact, impacts after 14 months. And we find that like, if we look at this, like the effect sizes increase significantly. They range now, depending on the test, from 0.26 standard deviations to 0.68 standard deviations. Uh, this is for children who are ever enrolled in school. We also have data on like self-reported school attendance. Uh, these effect sizes even increase a little bit more when, uh, when, that, when we use those. Um, how can we explain these findings? Like, um, maybe first to start with some of the process evaluation findings in general like the fidelity of implementation was very strong you can see it in this quote in this slide like the, it shows that the teacher is very good any time the children come to school there's no time to come back and like they're comparing it with some of the government schools and in general perceptions of the program are very positive um, this is one reason probably also why demand for education is higher in addition to some of the infrastructure that I previously mentioned, like we find effects like approx 8 percentage points, um, weekly attendance also increases, and interestingly also the age at enrollment increases. This is in line also with a non-experimental study that I uh, talked about previously. In addition to that, like we, now we spoke previously about school enrollment and school attendance, in addition to that it also seems uh, that um, the quality of education has increased, like both caregiver satisfaction has improved as well as um, the parent, uh, as well as the caregiver perception score about the quality of education. Um, the qualitative findings also show positive like um, perceptions of the quality of education. We will be able to give more details on that after our endline survey, where we're like at midline, we did not plan school level data collection. We are planning that at endline. Um, we also find, we don't find any like effects on parental aspiration for child's education. What we do find is like um, decreases in school expenditures, which may actually also improve, uh, have led to improvements in food security. As I previously mentioned, schooling is free under the Impact Network schools and that gives parents also some more opportunities to reallocate some of their expenditures, for example, from education expenditures to food expenditures which may in the end also lead to improvements in food security. So overall, like the midline results are quite promising. These are results after 14 months. Um, initially, we were planning to go back into the fields after three years, so two years after the midline survey. Uh, COVID has changed those plans a little bit. We're now planning to go back into the field after children have at least had another year of education. Um, so what we're really trying to see here is like, we found positive effects here in standard deviations. They look relatively large, but at the same time, like and this is in line with like 
what Alejandro was previously also mentioning, like learning outcomes are remain relatively low and maybe more is needed. Like one thing that we really want to see at endline is whether there's any whether there is any scope for exponentially increasing learning as a result of this program. Um, though we will have to take into consideration that COVID has obviously put a break on some of the education in Zambia and the endline qualitative study as well as the quantitative study we will examine some of the ability of the program to cope with like learning losses after COVID-19. Um, at this point we don't have any cost effectiveness estimates yet we are planning that um, um, we were planning to do that this year, but like we're, those plans have now delayed a little bit. We're in the process of doing so, but at Endline, we're also anticipating a cost effectiveness analysis of the program as well. Um, thanks so much. Excellent, thank you so much, um, Thomas. I'll be brief, I, I sent you the rest of the comments. I, I just wanna highlight how much there is still like about this paper. I think the careful and painstaking approach to sampling to both capture intensive and extensive margin effects uh, for children is uh, superb. The multiple measures of achievement, including both international standards and a domestic assessment, I think is also on point. The relentless, the relentless approach to follow up uh, with a 92% follow up rate, even in these very challenging conditions and the mixed methods aspect to the evaluation really, I think, paints a picture about what's happening inside of these schools from the perspective of teachers, students and parents. So just congratulations. I was just impressed and flabbergasted by the amount of effort that went into this um, into this trial. Um, I think, you know, you were alluding to this yourself. I think the, the main challenge that I have is more about the multifaceted nature of the intervention, how to think about the effects. So, you know, in the TOC that you presented, you have how, and also in the, in the paper, you have a section called pathways in which you chart different ways in which um, different components could lead to different intermediate and final effects. I think to the, to the extent that you can demonstrate that with uh, any inline data to see whether uh, more of this component leads more to this intermediate outcome and more to this uh, final outcome, even if endogenous, I think would help illustrate this. Um, I think just also um, maybe um, telling um, us a little bit more in the final paper about sort of the level of evidence that there is for different components. You know, like we have greater faith that some of these components will have an impact on, on achievement that will help the reader, I think, um, sort of um, put it into perspective. Um, and then I had a, a few questions, which were um, one about the outside options. You mentioned autonomous schools for children, but I didn't know whether this was the only school in some of these um, kids' villages or, or not. Um, I, I was particularly interested in whether you collected any data or plan to collect data uh, to capture uh, household substitution effects. So you know the Jeshnu Das um, et al. paper, um, which uh, shows household substitution effects from block grants to schools in Zambia and India. It would be interesting interesting to know whether this increased parental level of engagement that you see in your data is accompanied by maybe less expenditure. You do discuss this around nutrition, but I think seeing it across the board would be, would be somehow um, interesting. And then finally, if you can use the GPS data to look at heterogeneous effects by distance to the school, I think that would be fascinating. But wow, what a tremendous amount of work. Congratulations. Thank you. Hi. Um. We're just giving the floor to Alex as well. I realize we're probably going to take a little bit longer for the seminar than um, we anticipated initially, um, but I hope people can stay on. My, my presentation is pretty brief. I think I, I, I knowing that I was going to be at the end, it's I, I think I can do it in 10 minutes. And I think Sharon is going to send me her comments separately. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to put a bow on this in a reasonably timely fashion. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Um, can Thomas, can you see me, my, my slides? Great. All right. So hi, everyone. This is joint work with the wonderful co-authors that I've listed here. Um, the basic idea behind this work is to try to understand just how large of learning gains we can achieve when delivering education to really deprived parts of the developing world using a concerted strategy and sufficient resources to ensure a high level of fidelity. Um, the motivation for this is very like um, Ale's, so I'll skip it in the name of time, but the basic punchline is, despite large learning gains in the developing world over the last half century, there are pockets of poverty in the developing world with extremely low levels of literacy and numeracy. And so in this paper, 
we try to understand the effectiveness and cost of a concerted supply side intervention in raising basic learning levels, focusing on literacy and numeracy in pockets of extreme poverty. How we get at answering this question is we run a randomized controlled trial in rural Guinea-Bissau, evaluating a model school intervention. And what this means is we are delivering schooling from grade kindergarten to grade three in lieu of whomever the status quo provider would be in these villages with the idea that um, in these areas, the status quo is actually extremely low. There's very erratic provision of state delivered education and in some cases, private organizations deliver it, but that's also kind of hard to rely upon. Our intervention is highly resourced and it combines multiple things that we know work in isolation, a focus on learning, extensive monitoring of teachers and of student learning, and scripted lessons. Um, different than the work in Gambia, which several of us in this paper also contributed to, instead of running after school interventions with parateachers, here in Guinea-Bissau, the status quo provision is so low that we're actually just replacing the entire primary schooling experience for children. So this is very different and is a much more holistic approach to raising learning levels. Uh, a preview of results. After four years, we see transformative learning gains among children who are randomly assigned to receive the intervention. Um, compared to a baseline of very few kids being able to even read a single letter, much less a word or read a sentence, children in intervention villages largely can read full sentences and parse the meaning in those sentences and also perform basic arithmetic like addition and subtraction. This is a huge difference and it begs the question how. Um, we think that the how and the why comes from two main reasons. One, the nature of the intervention, both the combination of multiple, way, uh, multiple things that are known to be effective in isolation, but also the high level of resources that allows us to do this with a high level of fidelity. And then secondly, the very poor level of status quo provision, which we think means that these basic gains can be achieved uh, with a very large amount of magnitude, precisely because you're starting from a very low level. Um, for policy, the takeaways are one, that we can achieve this kind of gain even in the most deprived parts of the world, and the importance of the supply side in generating these kinds of gains. So briefly in the rest of the talk, I'll talk about where we did what we did, why we did it, and what we find. I'll skip the literature slide in the name of time. Um, we worked in rural Guinea-Bissau, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. There is extremely erratic state provision of public services from education to policing to health. There's no power grid or water grid outside of the capital. And um, we worked in these two southern regions of Guinea-Bissau, which are even poorer and have lower levels of learning than the rest of the country. And so again, the idea in picking these areas is potential for having very large gains precisely because the counterfactual is very, very little delivery of anything. The intervention, as I said before, provides primary school in lieu of the status quo provider. Um, it starts with one year of pre-primary um, to teach kids Portuguese, which is the national language of instruction. It then provides grades one through three in lieu of status quo provision. And it, um, uh, we, again, we hired trained teachers from the capital as opposed to parateachers from the village, precisely because learning levels are so low, it's very hard to find someone who has the ability to serve as a parateacher. Um, we talked about the features of the intervention, so I'll skip that. It's a cluster RCT. We worked in 49 villages. Um, there'll be a paper made available soon. Um, we had a lot of implementation problems. This thing got off the ground two years later than initially intended because of political economy concerns. That, that's another paper for another time. Um, but it, it, it's extremely difficult to work in these areas. This was not easy. Um, the inclusion criteria were villages that were small but had a sufficient number of children who would be participating in the intervention. And the children had to be between ages four and five when they enrolled in the study. The primary outcome, which we measured at the end of four years, is children's composite EGRA and EGMA test scores. So early grade reading assessment, early grade math assessments. Um, Thomas mentioned that these have floor effects, but even you know, I think they are designed to be particularly sensitive to low levels of learning. I think there's an open question whether if you are a, you know, measuring a floor effect on an EGRA or an EGMA test, whether there is real learning or not. Um, I, I think at the very least, these tests are sensitive to low levels of learning. And so we think it's a good indicator of whether any learning is really happening. So what we find is first a just 
dramatic difference in the overall test scores. There's a 58, this is a, these are, this is the distribution of test scores based on intervention status. The dark gray bars are the control group. The light blue hollow bars are the intervention group. On average, there's a 58.1 percentage point difference. Um, and again, sort of if you squint, the basic difference here is between being literate and numerate, being able to read sentences, conduct arithmetic, and not. You can break each test into different subtasks, which differ in terms of the difficulty. As the task listed here goes up in number, so does the difficulty going from letter recognition to reading and parsing the content of a paragraph. And what you see here is the percentage of correct answers by control and intervention group with control on the left and intervention on the right in kind of a lighter bar. And on the right hand side, the percentage of children in each group with zero correct scores. So this is really sort of evidence of total Ill illiteracy in this case. And what you see here again is just a dramatic difference across different levels of skill all pointing in the direction of children who receive the intervention being able to read and make meaning out of text, and the vast majority of control children not being able to. There's a similar gradient on the math tests, um, going from number recognition to two-digit addition and subtraction. Again, for percentage of answers correct and percent of children with zero scores, we see a similar pattern, although the intervention appears to be slightly less successful in raising uh, numeracy levels than literacy levels. So there are many control children, I'm sorry, intervention children who can't do two digit subtraction, for example, task 5b. But there's still a clear difference between control children, the majority of whom can't answer these questions right, and intervention children. In the paper, we have other stuff on heterogeneity. We don't find heterogeneity across wealth or parental education, primarily because these levels are just so low at baseline, and this corresponds to other work from the country. We see some evidence of learning spillover to siblings, and the mechanisms behind this show that progressing through grades is an important reason why um, the control children don't make it is as many kids get held back. So unlike in Cote d'Ivoire, like Sharon was talking about here, retention is very common. Um, we talked about why the estimates are so large, and so in the spirit of time, I will wrap. Um, we think that the policy implications are that we can achieve these large learning gains in hard to serve areas with low baseline learning levels. This is an expensive intervention, it costs a lot of money. I think our, um, our cost benefit ratio, benefit cost ratio was three ish. So we think that it is a net benefit, but it costs depending on who you ask, $400 per child per year, which in Guinea-Bissau is insanely high. That said, we think the importance of this paper is primarily to demonstrate that we can achieve these kind of gains. And that really it's much, there's much more gain to be had than thought possible previously. So this is not a policy that we wanna take necessarily to everywhere, but rather a proof of concept. Um, and secondly, again, as we're trying to address these issues, that the supply side seems to be a path forward. We varied supply without experimentally varying demand, and we saw this massive change, which we think provides important guidance for future work to work in these kind of areas. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I, I realize um, I, we're breaking our promise a little bit for questions at the end since we're already going over at this point. I take full responsibility for that. Um, I, I hope everybody enjoyed the presentations. Um, Sharon, like, I, I don't know whether in the next two minutes you would still like to give some comments um, on Alex's paper, like as a closer, like a, before we uh, drop off for everybody to uh, continue with the rest of their day. Sure, I'll be very, very quick. I'm gonna send Alex more detailed comments, but I just wanna first say, like I was so impressed by the persistence and tenacity of the team to get this project launched um, two years late, but um, still, um, you know, in, in the paper, they talk about that they were actually sued by the original cohort of teachers that were um, recruited and trained. And so anyway, just um, really impressive to see the large, you know, the team really working to make it, um, to make it viable. My one comment that I'll share now is that 
as Alex mentioned, this is an expensive program. Multiple components requires many resources, and it's part of a larger research agenda, I'm under, I have understood, to try to reach uh, really poor rural areas and um, reach this type of program uh, to different communities. And I'm wondering if there's any room to start thinking about the different components in the program um, and start to parse apart. Are there any really key ingredients or do you really need all of these together to achieve these large learning gains? Um, in places where the resources might not be available, might there be two or three key uh, ingredients that you could potentially replicate and maybe not get quite as large effect size, but maybe half of the size would be, still be quite large. Um, and so just to think about that in the, in the larger research agenda moving forward, is there a way to really try to parse out um, some of the key ingredients? I also thought their cost benefit analysis was really interesting, um, really clear outlining the assumptions that were being made around well, how can we think about longer term gains from the impacts on learning that were, um, were found in the shorter term. And so I'd encourage people to read one of the paper is out to read that is um, maybe a model for how to, to do that um, in future studies. Okay, thank you all so much. And thank you also for Shri for giving us the opportunity to present these papers. Um, we hope that everybody enjoyed the webinar and thank you all so much for attending.